Okay. Good day, everyone. And thank you for listening. This week's uh, Parsha of Kiseitse, Kiseitse la milchama lo ivecha, contains more mitzvahs in it than any other parsha in the Torah except Kedoshim. There is literally a plethora of commandments here in the parsha of Kiseitse, which leads all of the commentators to deal with the question of Chumish Dvorim, the entire book of Dvorim, is, so to speak, an add-on to the Chumish by Moshe Rabbeinu. We, uh, we are told, Kodesh Borcho Iskimo Al Yodo, the Rabboni Shalom Kaviochel agreed to it. And therefore it has uh, the legitimacy and the efficacy of being one of the five books of the Torah. But it's not exactly like the first four books. And in fact, we see in the Gemara that there's uh, an opinion amongst the Tanoim that uh, the method of deriving halacha, the Yud Gimel Midas Shator Nidreshes Bohem, and the 13 principles by which with the exegesis, so to speak, of the Torah can be derived, not all of them should apply here to Chumash Dvarim because Chumash Dvarim is basically Moshe's words that the Lord agreed with, whereas the first four books are, so to speak, the words from heaven, and Moshe is only the conduit. So the question arises, what if Moshe would not have uh, written Chumash Dvarim? What if we would not have made this great oration, this farewell speech that encompasses months and encompasses all of what we are reading over the past weeks and will read until uh, Simchat Torah? So then what would have happened to all the mitzvahs that are listed here? They're not listed in the first four books. So how would we have known or how would we have been able to deal with these mitzvot that would not have been written in the Torah? And that's a serious question. And there are different streams of thought, therefore, regarding this. One stream of thought that we find in the Mephorshim is that all of the mitzvot were really in the first four books, but that Moshe, so to speak, at the end of his life, edited the Torah in such a way that he took these mitzvot and he put them here in the fifth book. But had he not made a fifth book, had he not uh, spoken Chumash Dvarim, then they would have appeared in the first four books. In other words, the mitzvot would always have been in Torah Shabbat Saf. They always would have been part of Torah Shabbat Saf, of the written Torah, the only thing is that by uh, uh, 
uh, his uh, creating this fifth book, so that gave him leeway that he could take mitzvahs that ordinarily would have been put in the first four books, and he places them here in the fifth book. That's one idea that the Meforshim discuss. And that goes into the uh, idea of that the Rabbon Shalom agreed to it. He agreed, so to speak, that we could have mitzvot here in this fifth book, even if they were not mentioned before, as they should have been. And it's obvious that the mitzvahs were from before because Moshe Kibbal Torah Misinai. Moshe took the whole Torah, he got it all on Sinai. There's the second idea that uh, before she mentioned, there is uh, a concept in uh, the Talmud and in Jewish halacha that's called halacha la Moshe Misinai. Certain things that are not written, but nevertheless have the gravity and the efficacy of being as though they were written, and that's halacha la Moshe Misinai. And we have many things in halacha like that. There are many things, uh, uh, how do we uh, construct a tefillin? How do we know what tefillin are supposed to look like? So that's all halacha la Moshe Misinai. And there are many, many other mitzvot like that that uh, we only know it from Allah uh, Moshe Misinai. And the Mephoshim point out that Allah Moshe Misinai is a tradition uh, passed on from uh, the, through the Sanhedrin, through all the ages, that this is the way it's supposed to be. So therefore, this uh, stream thinks that these mitzvot were not written in the first four books, but nevertheless, they would have the status of halacha l'moshe misina. They would, so to speak, halacha l'moshe misina is the oral law and the written law, it's a bridge. It's not done through drashot. It's not done through uh, the Yud Gimel Midos Shator and the Drashas Bohem. It's stated as a fact, the way the mitzvahs are stated as a fact. But it's not written. And uh, that somehow would be the way that would be uh, acceptable to deal with all of these uh, mitzvot that appear, let's, let's say in this week's parsha that were not written before, but that uh, have a legitimate status of Halacha Lamosha Misinai, and therefore they would be here as well. That's a, a second idea that is advanced. There's a third idea that's advanced <clears throat> is that Moshe taught all of these mitzvahs. when he came down from Sinai, but that they acquired a special importance or poignancy now 
at this stage of his life, when the generation of the desert has departed, and the generation that's about to go in there to Israel uh, arises. So then he reviews these mitzvos because these become more practical and less theoretical. So there's kisayse la milchom aloivecho, is because they're going to have to fight a war to conquer Eretz Israel. And therefore, you have all these mitzvahs that are associated with warfare, with the army, etc. So therefore, they're placed here because there is a chronology in the Torah. Now it becomes important. Before it was a theory. So because something is a theory, it also has to be studied. Drosh v'kabel schar. But nevertheless, now that it's immediate, this is where it belongs because Moshe is talking to them right before they are going in there to Israel. Moshe will die uh, on the seventh day of Adar, and in Nisan they will uh, cross the Jordan and begin the Jewish story in the land of Israel. And that therefore, that's why it's placed here. The Ramban is a uh, great champion of the fact uh, that the chronological uh, order governs how things appear in the Torah. Rashi always is of the opinion, ein mugdam umuchar ba Torah. There's no real chronology. And just because something appears earlier doesn't mean that it happened earlier. It may not have occurred time-wise in the order that it's presented. But the Ramban disagrees with that. And he holds that the Torah follows a chronology. And what is written first is what occurred first. And therefore, these mitzvahs which apply to the entry of the Jewish people into the land of Israel, and so to speak, deal with that kind of a normal life. So uh, that's why they're written here towards the end, because now they become alive. So for instance, we have the mitzvah of Amalek, So the mitzvah of Amalek uh, um, um, uh, now will apply because they're going to meet Amalek. He's going, Amalek Yoshe Bohar. He is uh, dwelling in the hill country of Eretz Israel. And therefore, that mitzvah is real. And therefore, the Torah puts emphasis on it now. So these are different ideas, all of which exist, as to how to try and deal with the fact that we have quite a number of mitzvot here in the Parsha that we did not, that's not a repetition of what existed before in the written text of the first four books, but rather they are so to speak, new mitzvot, new commandments, new things that were told to us, that Moshe tells us. When this raises another issue, what do we need all these mitzvot for? We have a tradition that there's 613 mitzvot. Positive commandments and negative commandments. Can't can't we have a much more simplified Torah? We we see uh, uh, the nations of the world, uh, they have uh, 
a rather simplified religion. They, uh, you know, uh, it's enough to believe. It's enough to say you believe. But they don't have that. Uh, there are commandments that govern every step of the way in life. And that uh, one is constantly, so to speak, surrounded uh, by commandments as to what to do and what not to do. So the Mishnah that we all know uh, faces this issue head on. Israel. Lazako says a number of meanings. One meaning is that he wanted to give us merits. He wanted to give us an opportunity to uh, pile up brownie points, so to speak. Another concept of Lazakos is to cleanse us. Zach v'tahor. To purify us. To clean out the dross that often weighs us down. And then there's another idea of Lazakos is that to acquire I can be mezaki you if I want to give you something. It's a, an example, uh, I want to give you a gift on Shabbat. Now, uh, well, you're not allowed to make the Kenyan on Shabbat. You're not allowed to acquire it. A, well, you know, we have it many times. You're invited by somebody and you want to bring them a bottle of wine or uh, some some other gift. How is that allowed on Shabbat for you to do so? To transfer ownership. The transferring of ownership is prohibited and prevented on Shabbat. So there's a halachic mechanism that I can be mezakia you, Arab Shabbat. On Friday, I say, I take this bottle of wine and I give it to my friend X, Y, and Z. And I do so immediately now. I can be Mizaki, you. I can give you the power to acquire it now. And we have a rule of Zochin Lodom Shalobifonov. You can do that even when the other person is unaware that you're doing it. The host or hostess of where I'm going to eat Friday night doesn't know in advance that I'm bringing a bottle of wine. But they don't have to know. Because there's a power, a legal power in halacha, that I can be mezaki you. I can transfer ownership of things to you. So the the mission says Rotsakorishborchulizako says Israel. So we've discussed three possibilities of what that word means. To give us reward, uh, to cleanse us, to give us the ability to acquire greatness and holiness. And that's the reason why we have so many mitzvahs. We have such a great Torah. A Torah that has no end. A Torah that no matter how much you study it, there's more. And how much you know, there's more. An inexhaustible supply 
of spirit and knowledge and of faith and of strength. So God wanted to give us this gift. So therefore, the Fichachir Bolahem Torah Mitzvah, he gave us a Torah enormous in scope. 613 mitzvahs. So that wherever you would turn in life, there's a mitzvah. There is something that you can do. There's always a possibility to do something positive. Whether it's simply to say thank you, or it's simply to keep your mouth closed and not say anything. which is a great mitzvah, many, many times. Shenemar Hashem Chofetz Laman Tzitko Yagdil Torah V'yadir. It's a posseg in Yeshayahu. Hashem Chofetz Laman Tzitko, because of God's righteousness because of his sense of doing the right thing, so to speak. Therefore, he gave us so many mitzvahs so that we would have an opportunity every minute of our lives to be positive and accomplish something. Yagdil Torah, the Torah is so great and expands and we feel it over and over again in our lives. The Yadir in it becomes more glorious and it becomes more awesome as we experience life and as we come into different stages of our existence. So the blessing is that there's always a mitzvah to do. People think, you know, mitzvahs are a burden. Oh, yeah. Another halacha, another mitzvah. But uh, in, in its simplest form, we could say that the mitzvah is an opportunity. It's a chance to get closer to the Creator. It's a chance to cleanse ourselves. It's a chance to acquire another little piece of eternity. It's a ch chance to reward ourselves, to give ourselves merit. You know, I remember uh, when I was, I'm sure all of you also remember, you were in school. And the teacher asks a question. And everybody raises their hand. The teacher, teacher, you know, I know the answer. And the teacher naturally can only call on one student at a time. Well, if I knew the correct answer to the 10 questions and she never called on me, so I'm terribly frustrated. I remember once I came home and I, I even, I know in third grade, whatever it was, I complained to my mother. I said, you know, she, Miss Hatley, she called the, she asked all these questions and I knew all the answers and she never called on me. I raised my hand and she never called on me. So the Rabboni Shalom Kaviyochel didn't want us to have that feeling vis-a-vis -vis heaven, but that we don't have the opportunity to do it. You know, in, in uh, the good old days in Beit Knesset on sea, so uh, Moshe Lashinsky 
used to auction off certain honors for Simcha's Torah. And in our shul, the, uh, the person who, at the end of the auction, so to speak, had bid the highest for that honor, so he had the honor, and he was the one that paid. I was once in a shul where if you bid, you had to pay your bid even if you didn't get it. It was a different type of auction. And not only that, you were recognized for having bid. Mr. So-and-so, you know, the uh, Mr. Uh, uh, Cohen got uh, war, uh, bid the highest, okay, he's going to get coin, but Mr. Kagan, who uh, bid uh, less, but he bid, so we want to recognize him for bidding. And I felt that that was uh, not only a very good system for collecting money for the synagogue, but it also was psychologically much more soothing to someone that uh, didn't, uh, didn't win, so to speak, that they didn't uh, get the honor at the end. So now we gave him a little honor and he was able to contribute and he felt part of it because that's our nature. Our nature is that uh, we want the teacher to call on us when we have the right answer. We want to be recognized. Now, it could be I don't have as much money as Mr. Cohen. In the yeshiva world that I grew up in, so they didn't sell the honors for money but they sold it for commitment to the study, commitment to cover a certain amount of pages and folios in the Talmud over the year. That's what the commitment was. That's what the auction was. But when we auction for money, so then we're automatically excluding a lot of people who don't have that kind of money. Every year I hear that in uh, Shari Chesed and other places, you know, the mafter goes uh, $18,000, $25,000, $36,000. So on one hand, that's wonderful because that shows the greatness of the love that people have for Torah. But on the other hand, there are a lot of people that don't have $18,000 to bid. And you've excluded them completely. And I don't, uh, I don't make any judgments, but it rankles me a little. So the Rabon Shalem wanted to give everybody a chance. And therefore, he gave us mitzvahs that cover every circumstance in life. No matter what your financial or personal or social or even religious status may be, you're surrounded by mitzvahs. You can do whatever, uh, you can do God's will uh, hundreds of times a day. And therefore, we have these types of parshas, like Doshim and Kitetse, that are a plethora of mitzvahs, that are just loaded down with mitzvahs. You go by a bird cage, yeah, yeah, a bird nest, you know, okay, it's a mitzvah. Cleanliness is a mitzvah. Destroying evil is a mitzvah. 
treating people nicely as a mitzvah, not slandering people. I mean, all of that became a mitzvah. What the world calls civilized behavior, of which uh, it's hard to define and even harder to find. Uh, we don't have civilized behavior. We have uh, mitzvahs. What did the Torah tell us to do? And if there were not enough mitzvahs that the Torah told us, so the rabbis came, the rabbanan, the chachomim, and they added more mitzvahs because they saw greater opportunities. And people are always looking for opportunities. There are uh, entire uh, service industries that are built on the fact that they provide you with opportunities. Opportunities for investment, opportunities to hire people, opportunities to travel, it's all opportunities. So the Rebbe Shalom Kaviyochel is also in the opportunity business. He also grants to us opportunities, except the opportunities are called mitzvot, and there are positive ones and negative ones. There are opportunities that we should take advantage of, and then there are opportunities that we should stay away from, that injure us, that demean us. And by making such a great Torah, an all-encompassing Torah, that covers every facet of human life, there is nothing that is left out. There's no subject that is not covered. So then that's an expression of God's love for us. Lizakos is Israel. He wanted us to be great. He wanted us to be special. He wanted life to have meaning. He wanted us to be eternal. And so when we read this Parsha and we see all the mitzvahs, we should bear in mind that this is because Ratzah Kodesh Baruch Hu Lezakos is Israel. This is the great gift that the Lord has given to the Jewish people. And that is really the gift that keeps on giving because over and over again, day in and day out in our lives, all of these opportunities are present and we have the, the ability through our free will to take advantage of the opportunities and to perform the mitzvahs Kasher Tziva Lonu Hashem Elokeinu. The Lord and God has ordered for us. Lasos is called Mitzvah Satoru Hazah. To do all of the commandments, take advantage of all the opportunities. And then we are Zoche, Lazakos is Israel to merit and to cleanse and to achieve, to gain and to grow great as the Lord intended for us to do. So I want to thank you all for listening and I want to wish you a Shabbat Shalom. And the Mir Tzashem uh, Sunday, uh, we will still have a class in Pirkei Ovot. We're coming to the end of the season, but we'll continue for until Rosh Hashanah. Please stay well, everyone, and thank you for listening. Cold tube seller.